कम दिन का तक कर रहा है पर It's Saturday morning, and we're on a quiet residential street just a few yards from the US-Mexican border. We've had a tip-off. There's been a shooting in this flat above a supermarket. I understand a woman's been killed here, sir. But the police aren't too keen to give me information. All we know is the woman's body's still in the apartment, and the area's now an active crime scene. But we're in a city with one of the highest murder rates in the world, and the shootings greeted with weary resignation. The coroners here are busy, always. But what she's found inside this time is pretty horrifying. Is the female um, 70, 75 years? Whoa. Do you think she was somehow is a drunk? Drug cartel? Yeah. Okay. This area. Yeah. Even for Tawana, the execution of a woman in her 70s is a terrifying escalation. But this is the reality in Mexico today. No women, not mothers, not daughters, not sisters, not even grandmothers are safe from an epidemic of brutality that's killing thousands of them a year. On the outskirts of the city is the largest refugee center in Mexico. Huge numbers of Mexicans are on the run, with nearly 380,000 fleeing their homes over the past 15 years. And the crisis is getting worse every day. That is going to be our new shelter. It's a huge shelter in all the the families are going to sleep in there. How many people can well, it take? Well, I think we're going to put 2,000 people in there. Thing is, the women and children here aren't running away from some cataclysmic natural disaster. This is all man-made. What is it they're running from? They are running because we have an internal war. All the characters are killing the people from Michoacan, from Guerrero, from Guanajuato, and they're running to be safe. You are talking about the characters, and they're going to, to your home, and they're going to kill women, the small children, and they're going to kill everybody in your house. All the women here have witnessed, suffered, and somehow survived this shocking brutality. Isabel's only in her 20s. She fled here from the south. And having seen what the cartel did to her brother, she's terrified. Ahí lo dejaron a él con una bolsa, con un, lo enredaron pues como una bolsa, lo taparon. Many of the women are too traumatized to talk openly about their experiences. But Yasmin's determined that we hear her story. She tells me how a drug cartel broke into her family home, kidnapped her and held her to ransom for one very long week. What happened during those seven days? 
No, pues una tortura muy, muy fea. Y con las pistolas, le dije, parto ya saben el lugar donde te tienen. O sea, nosotros no sabemos dónde nos tienen porque todo el tiempo estábamos encapuchados y también tanto nosotros como ellos estaban todo el tiempo encapuchados y no quieren que los viéramos. Pero le dijeron que él trabajaba... When the authorities came looking for them, the consequences were horrific. Pero por él, a él se lo llevaron. Pero no veía, pues nomás escuchaba que decían que, que se nos quedábamos callados, que no hiciéramos nada de ruido, que porque estaban pasando los de la Guardia Nacional. Y este, en eso cuando pasaron, se llevaron a uno y lo mataron en el baño. Entonces, para el segundo, me dijeron que yo fuera. Yo no quería ir. Entonces, ya cuando va, el señor ya lo tenían, lo horcaron primero. Le pasaron el cuchillo, lo degollaron de, de la cabeza, del cuello, pues. Le agarraban la cabeza, la aventaban, como si estuvieran jugando, o sea, con una pelota, con algo. Yasmin was beaten and tortured repeatedly before she was finally released by her captors. I'd heard of the cartel's reputation, almost delight for savagery, but this young woman's story really brings home the depths of their depravity. Yasmin and her children are now stuck in limbo. Like all the women here, she's far too scared to return home. For them, the refugee camp's the final stop on a journey they pray will deliver them to safety. And this is why the women flee to Tawana. It's proximity to the United States. This is the world's busiest border crossing. And every day, hundreds of thousands of journeys are made between the two countries. For those looking for salvation from the violence in Mexico, crossing the border, either legally or illegally, is their last hope. But that's becoming increasingly difficult. The lack of protection for women means that record numbers are now looking to escape the country, and those trying to help them are utterly swamped. Nicole's a human rights lawyer who handles thousands of visa applications a year, and her casework is a catalogue of atrocities. We've worked with women that have been burned, have been mutilated, have been gang raped, have been sold. We work with women that are so terrified that they won't even leave the shelter because they feel as soon as they step outside those doors that they could die. And the violence inflicted on Yasmin is not the only form of brutality many in Mexico face. Thousands of women in the refugee camps are also fleeing extreme domestic abuse a crime that affects about one-third of the female population here. Women in many circles are not viewed as persons of value, uh, are viewed as property um, under the ownership of other persons, whether that's organized crime, whether that's their father or their spouse. Women's lives don't matter. Women's lives are not valued here. Maria knows what it's like to live in a world where your life has no value. Every day she was terrorized by the narco gangs who ruled her neighborhood. And every night she suffered at the hands of a partner who beat and threatened to kill her. Pero él siempre me dijo que yo no, si yo me iba, él se iba a quedar con los niños. Y yo pues era por lo que yo tenía que no no lo dejaba hasta que agarró ese cuchillo y mi hijo se dio cuenta. Mi hijo lo vio y se, y se le echó casi encima y, y le gritó. Le dijo que, que soltara el cuchillo. Yo me iba a permitir de que hiciera algo así y le dije que soltara el cuchillo. Él reaccionó y lo soltó. Y después él eh, agarré el cuchillo y lo tiré. Y ahí él se quedó nomás parado. 
Yeah. You were right, Maria, listening to that. You've got a very brave boy. Yo le digo que yo le doy gracias a Dios porque si no hubiera sido por él, a lo mejor su papá si hubiera, si hubiera encajado al cuchillo. Talking to this family and the others in the camp, it's more and more evident how extreme the violence is being meted out to these women, but also how much it forms part of their daily lives. One of the, the most striking things for me is a sort of acceptance that something absolutely horrific is going to happen to them sooner or later. There is such a level of violence against women that not only do they feel that it's inevitable something will happen to them sometime, but they're probably right. For tonight, at least, the camp offers these women and their children a place of sanctuary from a world that holds often unimaginable terrors. And over the next few days, as we spend more and more time on the streets of Tawana, we begin to get more of a sense of just how brutal that world is. The border city of Tawana is one of the most violent in the world. Someone in there. It's a magnet for both Mexican and international criminal gangs who battle to control the multi-billion dollar businesses of drugs and people trafficking. In the first six months of this year alone, there have been more than 850 murders and the death toll for this weekend reaches a staggering 20. We just heard of another incident. Apparently, one person might have been shot dead, another badly wounded. We're back in the city's northern quarter, just a few meters from the border. The woman who lives in the house where the shootings took place tells me she heard a noise outside. Well, they were barely coming in the door, and I was walking to open it because it had a lock on, and as soon as I was going to open it, I heard the gunshots. And, well, they were both on the floor. Turns out the victims were Jennifer's husband and her brother-in-law. And they were gunned down whilst her two young children were in the house. I just told my oldest, like, don't look, because I couldn't even open the door. They were right there. Like, I, they were in the way. And I was like, just don't look, you know? The little girls. Uh, yeah, one is two and the other one is ten. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, I mean, eh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the police are going to do. Jennifer's almost numb with shock. When a few short seconds, a seemingly random act of violence has left her a widow and her young family without a father. Well, I have my... I'm, I'm five months pregnant right now. And why have my girls? So I don't know. Right now, I really don't know anything. Her devastating loss is a reminder that murder statistics only ever count the dead. But the suffering of those who are left behind is impossible to measure. The overall responsibility for protecting the citizens of Tawana lies with the city's 41-year-old mayor. Is it all right if I put a microphone okay. on you? Montserrat Caballero was the first woman to hold this position. She was elected 18 months ago on a promise she'd crack down on organized crime. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you again. But with 20 murders in the last two days alone, I'm already getting the impression she's facing an impossible task. Big problem here is the guns. This month, I got 150 guns off the street. But what is the problem? The guns come all the time, every day. I mean, that's crazy high numbers. Yeah. Crazy high it's numbers. It's crazy. I got, to this year, 1,300. To this year, just for this year. The city streets just aren't safe for a woman who's received countless death threats. 
but Montserrat insists it's important to be seen to be doing her mayoral duties. So for each public engagement, she's accompanied by a specialist team of armed bodyguards who travel everywhere in a convoy of bulletproof vehicles. This is the supposedly the most dangerous zone in the city. In the and, corner. And you get your hair done in the most dangerous part of the city. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense, total sense. <laughs> Her job's no ordinary job, but then this woman is no ordinary woman. So her daily routine includes a trip to the hairdressers in the heart of the red light district. And while these visits seem to make her security detail nervous, the mayor's determined to show no part of the city is off limits to her. There's something very cool about a mayor who comes to the most dangerous part of the city and gets her hair done. So every day, this is my seat every day. The salon's popular with the female workers of Tawana's booming sex trade. Many of them, like Montserrat herself, have fled from the cartel violence of southern Mexico. And it's this background that's made her somewhat of a role model for a new generation of politicians who are determined to bring an end to the bloodshed in their country. Your vision is a, a, a future without really heavily armed men having to patrol the area. Yeah, it, it's... You get to a stage where it's safe enough without them. You can feel safe them. without them. You can walk and you can come with... Because some people feel scared about soldiers. But I hope someday we can walk, like, without them. I imagine you can't do a job that she's doing without actually hoping that you can make a difference and try and solve it. So she's got to have that firm belief. Like she says, she's been driven by her mother telling her all her life, you can do it, you can do something. So she's starting out to tackle a massive challenge, believing that she can do it. Can she do it? Well, it's going to be very, very hard. And I mean, she's, she herself has got to be a target from some cartels. But it's not long before we face yet another reminder of the scale of the problems she faces. Travelling out of the city, we run into a group of demonstrators. Marches like these are a common sight across the whole of Mexico. These women are protesting that not enough is being done to help them find Los Desaparecidos, the missing ones. Both men and women have disappeared, but it's the female figures that are so alarming. They've increased threefold just in the last six years. Given the brutality of Mexico's narco wars, it's easy to guess their likely fate. But none of these women are giving up hope. Olga tells me about her daughter, who's been missing for just over three years. The last she heard was that she was stopped by a gang of armed men. Behind every missing poster, there's so many questions, but Olga's hunt for answers about her daughter is especially poignant. And that evening, we travelled to the family home to find out more about the girl who vanished into thin air. And what, what was she like as a six-year-old? Even though Selena's been missing for so long, her parents can't accept she may never come home. This is her, her bed? Mm -hmm. This one? This is closer. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've kept all her clothing, you've kept everything. <laughs> Tengo toda su ropa, pero está todo revuelto. Todo. Todo. 
todo está igual como ella lo dejó. If you believe she's still alive, what's going through your head about what she's going through if she's alive? Yo siento que la escucho todos los días, mi hija llorando. Yo siento que la escucho, que la escucho, que la daño. No sé. Yo siento que escucho su voz. que la están dañando. Es una tortura para mí, es una tortura, pero trato de hacerme la fuerte por mi hijo, por mi otra hija. Pero... Guantes. ¿Ya le falta guantes? Thousands of families all over Mexico regularly come together to hunt for the missing ones. This is every parent's worst nightmare. But their determination never to give up is inspirational. Where is Olga? What is that? Olga, wait a minute. Okay. Can, we, can we walk up with you? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Today, Selena's parents have joined a search party in the high ground surrounding Tawana. These hills are often used by the local cartels to dump the bodies of their victims. The family spend hours looking, but it feels hopeless, mostly desperate. But late in the afternoon, a call comes over the radio of a possible lead. Remains have been found abandoned in a storm drain. There's a flurry of excitement. But they turn out to be the bones of a small animal. It must be so disheartening for you when you keep on getting moved on and going from place to place to search. La verdad sí, o sea, es triste, o sea, ir a lugares y regresar, como se dice, con las manos vacías. Pero, pues, siempre que vayamos, vamos con la esperanza de, de poder, este... Si no encontramos a nuestra hija, al menos, si encontramos a alguien más, pues, ayudamos a otras personas que puedan descansar de, de, de esto, porque, la verdad, es algo muy duro. Today's search has ended in crushing disappointment. But Olga and Alvaro and all the other families will return hoping that one day they may find the answer to the most heartbreaking mystery of their lives. Mexico's drug war means that while Tijuana is one of the world's most violent cities, it's still a popular tourist resort. Thousands of visitors cross the border every night. Here they can stay in luxury hotels and there are hundreds of bars and nightclubs, as well as an army of drug dealers. And there's another multi-million dollar industry that attracts tourists and criminals alike. The sex trade. Prostitution is legal here. But some of the most notorious drug cartels have now branched into human trafficking. Women are transported from all over the country to Tijuana for sexual exploitation. Either here or over the border in the United States. This is where we would do our dances, you know? How long would you do? Just going up, going up. And he wouldn't be able to stop you. V used to be a sex worker. 
She started as a pole dancer in one of the clubs in the red light district. And like many, her decision wasn't really a choice, but made out of economic desperation. When I first started working here was because um, we were behind on rent. It was like, I think $900 that we were late on rent. It was a couple months past due. I had just had the baby um, and uh, there really wasn't any other alternative. Within a short time, V moved from dancing to charging the men for sex. Kind of loosen up mm -hmm. with the customer, get to know them a little bit. Up a bit. Yeah, warm them up a bit, tease them a little bit. And then once their 10 minutes are up here, you just go back and drink or they get the courage to go upstairs. But with the extra money came extra risk as her pimp savagely assaulted her if she didn't hand over her earnings. That's beating after beating and it was, it was crazy. And eventually like that got to me. He just attacked me, you know, and he would just like hit me bit with his bare fist. I think I got like a really bad one right here, but it was like mainly all over my side. So all of this was like completely bruised, all of it. The fear of beatings left V feeling unable to escape, even when one of her co-workers was savagely murdered. I saw the pictures. I saw all the pictures. What did, what did it show? She had no arms, she had no legs, um, you know, and it was just... It was scary. Trapped and terrified, V became addicted to drink and drugs. I just got lost, you know? You kind of just lose a part of yourself, you know? You lose a part of who you are, lose a part of, you know, you, you give a little bit of yourself to every man that you come across, you know, and have sex with. With the help of a family friend, V eventually checked into rehab and broke free from prostitution, an escape that she's convinced saved her life. Girls who are still now in the industry, my heart goes out to them. I, I don't know how they do it day in and day out, you know? Not everyone has the same look that I do, you know? There's girls that die, you know? And they don't come back. But there is one person determined to protect the women on the streets of Tijuana. I tried to make a message for the city. These girls, it's same like me, same like you. They are not different. Earlier this year, the authorities started to investigate Adelita, one of Tijuana's biggest sex clubs. A joint operation was set up by the mayor and the federal government to monitor criminal activity in and around the club, and in particular, the use of underage girls in prostitution. I don't care who is the, the owner. I don't care uh, the problems I can have. If they have uh, children's work there, I go too close. It was a bold move that risked making the mayor many powerful enemies. You must have upset a lot of people. How worried are you for your own safety? It's very dangerous, but I don't feel scared because when you take some, you're a reporter, right? You go to the war, it's dangerous, but you have a responsibility. So I have responsibility to do, to prevent, and I have responsibility to talk about, about these people. The mayor's made it her mission to crusade against organized crime. But there's no escaping that she's taking on some of the world's most ruthless criminals. And that makes her very vulnerable and me very worried. The growing exploitation of underage girls in the sex industry is deeply distressing. I want to get a sense of just how many of the most vulnerable are at risk. This gives me an insight, a sanctuary for the child victims of extreme physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Are they all doing it or just one of them? Maestra, todas participan o solo ella? It's run by Alma Tucker. 
who for the past 30 years has been fighting against people trafficking and the exploitation of minors. So tell me about this little thing's history. We're so blessed to have this baby in this house and her mom, his mommy. The uncle started a first sexual assault in her when, since she was 10, to the point that he started bringing men to the house to have sex with her. She's here now with us and she's relieved that she's free and also her baby is free. After all their early trauma, Alma's determined to give these young girls a fresh start. But she knows it's going to take a long time for them to fully heal. When the girls come to this home, they lost a lot of hope. They don't trust us. They feel, I'm here, but when they're going to take advantage of me? We try to encourage them values in life. This picture uh, represents um, those values, uh, the respect, love, being strong, and have faith. <laughs> Alma's vocation is to give these girls a safe haven, but she has to be constantly vigilant. Many of these children's abusers still look for them, and she's terrified about the increasing role of organized crime in child sexual exploitation. What we're doing is we don't stop the... How big is it in Tawana? I think it's big. Um, what I'm hearing for uh, um, testimonies of other oh, girls that they're being rescued, they're saying it's a lot of girls. It's a lot of money in this industry. Why? Because one drug, you sell it once. But a human, you can sell it 10, 20, 25 times a day. And a child? Oh, yes. You can sell yes. hundreds of times. A hundred of times. And it must make you rage inside. I mean, just listening to you makes me rage. Yes, uh, makes me very angry, makes me very... I, I wish I'm, I have more power to do more things, but it's, um, I, I cannot do more than I, I've been doing, it, and I'm praying to God to give me a strength to keep doing this. If it wasn't for Alma, the outside world for these girls would be a truly living hell. They're celebrating the chance to be children again. And it's all down to another woman of Tawana. With the guts, determination and sheer humanity to step up and fight for the rights of the most vulnerable. I thought Alma was amazing. She'd got an incredible aura and all the girls responded to it. She's like their mother. The things that they noted about her was that she was gentle, she was kind, she was good. I'd want her as a best friend or, or a, a mate. Alma's house may well be a haven of happiness. But as we travel back into the city, we're again faced with reminders that in this shockingly violent society, the security and well-being of women is something that can never be guaranteed. At the refugee camp, the congregation has gathered for a special service of thanksgiving. The people being called forward have been told their time here is coming to an end. They include Maria, whose son Ian stopped his father from killing his mother. Maria has been given an appointment with the US Immigration Service. If she can persuade them that her life is in danger, she'll be allowed to join her relatives over the border in California. Yeah. 
This is the moment that everyone here dreams of, the chance to escape to a new life and a better world. Up in the hills overlooking the city, Selena's father, Alvaro, is coming to the end of his search. He and his friends have found nothing. But they receive a request to move on to another site. It's a few miles along the road down by the ocean. And a young woman's reported her father missing. The man's sister is amongst those who've joined the search. Who do you think they belong to? She recognized these jeans from his brother, from her brother. Her brother disappeared here. The young woman's also identified some clothes. And they're her father's? Yes. And now the outcome of the search is looking increasingly bleak. A few minutes later, everyone's worst fears are confirmed when bloodstains are found in an abandoned outhouse. A forensic examiner gets to work. And the house is now officially a crime scene. It's one of the dozens that are set up all around the city every day in a cycle of violence that shows no sign of ending. The cartels revel in their reputation for savagery here, and it has a purpose. My name's Alex. I'm a, I'm a British journalist. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to talk to you at this time. It means people are too scared to speak out. We're not here to get anyone into trouble. We're just here to help. No, it's OK, it's OK. I'm, I'm just saying to her, if she wants to talk... What's really striking is just how much fear there is, how terrified people are of talking and, and even speaking out about uh, disappearances, about killings, about kidnappings. They're, they're just so terrified. Even the relatives who've got nothing to do with it are worried that they'll be hunted down and they too will end up dead. This is the harsh reality in Mexico today. As the violence increases, so too does the desire to escape and find a better life. Migration figures are now at the highest for 20 years. But the greater the numbers, the greater the backlash against those desperate to flee. I... What happened? What happened? Oh, what happened? Hola! What happened? Come on. No, but it's in Montilla, llegamos. It's heartbreaking. Twelve hours ago, Maria was convinced the family was going to be safe from all those threatening her. Now she'd been thrown back on the streets by a system that doesn't accept she's suffered enough. Do you think they've got the whole idea of what's going on in Mexico wrong? If they, if they think there's no war here? A lo mejor ellos no saben porque ellos no van allá, no están viviendo todo lo que la gente vive que la gente a veces está escondida en sus casas, que no pueden salir, que está la balacera y, y te tienes que esconder abajo de las casas. Tell me, what did you think when you realized you were coming back? No, porque solo estar aquí era un sufrimiento. Solo eso. The sight of a young family abandoned as night falls in such a dangerous city is a particularly haunting one. They are the image of just how far their country and the world 
is failing them. The truth is, during my time here in Tawano, I've found very few reasons to be optimistic. They're virtually non-existent. The exceptions have been the pastor who runs the refugee camp. It's the first school for the migrant people in Tijuana. He works tirelessly to provide accommodation to thousands of families who'd otherwise be at the mercy of the world's most brutal gangs. And then there's Alma Tucker, the fearless crusader against sexual exploitation. <laughs> Who's rescued so many girls from the darkest of places and given them fresh hope. And finally, there's the mayor and her determination to carry on fighting. Do you think you'll ever be able to stop the violence against women? Yeah, we can. We can if we work together. She pushes on no matter how great the risk to her personal safety from her many enemies. Esta mañana, alrededor de las 8.35, una escolta de avanzada de la alcaldesa Montserrat Caballero... A few days after we leave the city, our worst fears become all too real. The news breaks that the mayor's convoy has been ambushed. It's a carefully coordinated attack that bears all the hallmarks of a cartel hit squad. Operations a report of the shooting reaches me whilst we're covering the war in Ukraine. And as soon as we can, we try to find out what's happening in Tawana. Hi, Montserrat. Hi, how are you? We were very worried looking at what had happened. What, what did happen? I was, I was with my bodyguard. And when he goes and um, in a way, somebody stopped him and, and shot him, shoot at him. Mm. But Montserrat, you could know. you. It sounds like you had a very narrow escape. I mean, you could end up getting killed. I'm very lucky person. They tried to scare me, and and I hope not nothing happened to me or my family. But I, I'm I'm really work hard, and I still working hard. That's pretty staggering bravery. Why Why is it so important to you? Because I want a freedom for my country. We, we, we are not in war like, like Ukraine, but we have a war with these cartels. We have a war and I want a free freedom to my, to my city, to my country. Freedom from this violence for a nation in the grip of such a brutal drugs war seems a very distant hope. But the savagery now being deliberately directed against the women of Mexico means they must no longer remain invisible. And unless the world wakes up to the full scale of the atrocities being committed here, the future for millions of those most at risk is too terrible to contemplate.